So as we are uh, sitting here, I just got a text from Taylor saying that she's unable to chair the meeting. So Allie, um, are you available to chair this meeting? Um, <laughs> yeah, I guess so. Hang on, I was not prepared to do that. So I just got the text. This is like literally right now. <laughs> um, yeah, let me get, let me pull. Sorry, I was dealing with a another issue when when we were starting. Let's see. Um, I'm sorry, Ellie, and no worries. No, it's okay. Wait five minutes. It's okay. Just give me give me like one minute to pull up the agenda. Oh, sure. And I can even pull it up, share the screen. I'm happy to help you however it takes. Oh, I'm good. I think I think I got it here. Okay, cool. Okay. So, and I don't even know, I don't think we have all the board members yet. I don't even think they've gotten on yet. Okay, we'll wait. We'll wait like two or three more minutes then. Uh, Ali, I was just looking at the agenda and just so you're aware, it looks like there's an incomplete list of the members. So just to give you a heads up on that. Who are we missing? Oh, wait, sorry. I was actually looking at the wrong agenda. My apologies. Okay. I was, okay. I did the same thing first. <laughs> I was and like, I realized I was on the wrong one. Yeah, that's for the housing <laughs> agenda. I know. And can all the board members uh, come on video? Uh, if you're on, that'll help us count. And then also that I think that's a rule of these open uh, meeting laws that you're all there. Yeah, Sheila, <laughs> way to show up. <laughs> I'll be switching to a computer soon. So maybe one more. We need one more, right? Am I counting right? Yeah. Sheriff Furlong said he's not going to be able to make it, and Eric Schoen is also not available. Uh, Amy Hines Sutherland just texted me. She'll be here in five minutes. Okay. While we're waiting to get started, thank you for yesterday, Jessica. I appreciate you more than you know. Ah, thanks. We missed you at the Lyon County Behavioral Task Force. We will have to, we need to schedule time anyway, but we'll have to add that to the list of things to recap. That's major, yes. Yeah. Okay. 
Okay, I'm going to go off screen for a few minutes, and then I'm going to transfer to a computer. So if you lose me, I'll be right back, but I'm hoping it's, like, seamless. Okay, great. And then, yeah, Amy Hines Sutherland just joined. Is that going to give us enough, though, Jess? I'm not sure. I think we'll have seven with Shayla, unless you want for Shayla to wait to wait for Shayla. Oh, no. Oh, we can just, we can count her as here. Okay, yeah. so we'll go ahead and get started then. Um, we will call the Northern Re Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board uh, meeting to order. It is February 3rd at 2.06. We'll go ahead and take roll call and to get started. So uh, Taylor Allison, I know she's not going to be here today. Um, I'm here. Allie Bannister, Dr. Robin Titus, Laura Yanez. I'm here. Hi, Laura. Nikki Aker. Present. Hi, Nikki. Hello. Heather, Cor Heather Korbelik. Lana Roberts. I'm here. Hi, Lana. Um, Sheriff Ken Furlong. Shayla Holmes is here. I don't. I think she's transferring to her computer. Uh, Doctor. I'm here. Uh, Dan, thank you, Shayla. <laughs> Doctor Dan Gunnerson. I'm here. Eric Schoen. Doctor Amy Hines Sutherland. Here. Hi, Amy. And Hi. Sandy Workrow. Uh, she also said that she was going to be absent today. Perfect. Thank you. Okay, so we have a quorum. So we'll go on, move on to item number two, which is public comment. Is there any public comment before we move on? Okay. Oh, Dr. Titus is coming on, just so you're aware. Oh, good, okay, perfect. Okay, so seeing no public comment, hearing none, we will move on to item number three for possible action. Review and approval of minutes from January 6, 2022. Did everybody have a chance to review the minutes? I will make a motion to approve. I thought they looked fine. Thank you, Dr. Gunnarsson. Can I get a second? I'll second. Thank you, Laura. All in favor, say aye. 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 I, can I just I submitted a request to say that I left at 245 and that's been added from Nikki. Informational purposes only. This is an update on Northern Region Be Behavioral Health Housing Subcommittee and discussion of next steps. Amy, do you want to go or do you want me to give the update? It's up to you. Um, no, yeah, happy to. So we have a meeting scheduled. So um, that is our next step. We have a meeting scheduled with some presenters. And um, thank you to Jessica for getting all of that arranged for us and hope to learn more about how we can support behavioral health housing. And um, we have a plan to submit recommendations back to the board if we're ready after the next meeting. If we're not ready after the next meeting, we'll solicit more presentations. And when we are ready, we will do that. Yeah, and the two presentations, just to sell it to the crowd, are going to be great. Uh, we have um, Kirsten Colomb with Medicaid, and she's really been overseeing 1915I. And then... Um, and 1915I, just so you guys know, is the service that really is flexibly able to support people in housing from like one hour a day, one hour a week to like 20, well, 24 seven potentially. Um, but so anyway, that is coming on board in Nevada in the next couple of months or a year. And then uh, we have Corporation for Supportive Housing that has worked with states across the nation that are quote, light years ahead of us. So we don't have to recreate the wheel. Um, they all have a lot of best practices and can kind of help lay out what has been done and that we what we might uh, wanna look 
towards in our region. Perfect, thank you, Amy. Thank you, Jessica. Any questions on that? Okay, we'll go ahead and move on to item number five for possible action. Review of Northern Board Annual Report and develop a vote on board recommendation, recommendations to be included in the report. Jessica, did you wanna start us off? Yeah, happy to. So uh, just for everyone's awareness, I sent this out to the board members on Tuesday for their review. Uh, if you weren't, if you didn't have the time to, to look at that, uh, no problem, because um, we can go over it now. I don't think this should be too boring. The other thing that I sent out to the region that um, I'd like some input in right now is, uh, so we can look at the recommendations, but also I provided some safe voice data and there was also data from the behavioral health survey. So I guess if I could get input from your, you guys in terms of would you like to look at that and then the recommendations or should we do a quick review of the report, look at the data and then come back to the regulate, uh, recommendations, any thoughts? And I have another thought as you guys are thinking about it. Can I just ask one more thing? is that the priorities that we put in there, and maybe this is a misstep on my part, so please let me know. The priorities we put on there, we've been working on, they are relevant, but they are not updated priorities for 2022, right? And I was thinking we haven't really determined what at what point we stop those priorities and update them for the next year or how long those priorities extend, but it could be that we had priorities that we really fleshed out that you are not interested in keeping as priorities. Um, so I thought for the sense of brevity to have priority gap need recommendation, but it might make sense to say these were our priorities. Here are our recommendations not tied to them. So thoughts on any of this. Robin Titus here. I would say that it, um, our recommendations must be tied to our priorities. So maybe we need to make sure our priorities are the same as what we did in 2021. Um, but, I, but I wouldn't want to recommend anything that wasn't a priority. Yes. Okay. That makes sense. And then also we have an entire month. This isn't due until March. So we are ahead of schedule in case there is any deviation. You're not under the gun here. And did the board members want to want Jessica to do a quick review just so you know where we're all at, or you want to do that on your own time? Of the data or the, the data. Okay, yeah. Do you guys want to see it quick, the data? I bet I can yeah. do it in five minutes. That yeah, would that'd be great. great. Okay, and I want to give uh, credit to, I have these amazing interns, two of whom are like producing excellent quality work timely. So one of the interns took the safe voice data and actually created charts um, that I sent out. And I'll just pull that up for everyone who didn't get a chance to look at those charts. Uh, and so for, every, for people who don't know, safe voice is a reporting system statewide for the schools um, that really is trying to capture reports of threats to student well uh, student well-being. So it looks at bullying, cyberbullying, suicide, abuse and neglect. And I could send out all the raw data. We just really tried to focus on stuff that we thought you'd be interested in that is more associated with behavioral health. Um, so, and I thought this was good because we've talked so much about youth suicide and we haven't seen any data on it. And so this is at least one data piece that we could turn toward. Um, so with Carson City, just really quickly, you can see that suicides have, they've like doubled. It doesn't look like that big here. Um, suicide threats have doubled. But if you look at the actual numbers, it's kind of like it goes from 17 or you know around there. And then I think it goes all the way up to almost 70. So there's a big jump there um, from 2019 to 2021. Uh, child and abuse and neglect, slight increase. Bullying, you see some big changes. Um, and then handle with care, interesting. Handle with care is when kids outside of school have experienced a traumatizing event, like their you know, law enforcement were called to their home due to a dispute. A parent was arrested. They got put in the hospital. Something happened. Uh, 
a text is sent to their teacher the next day when they return to say, hey, be soft, gentle with this kid. He's just gone through a bunch of stuff and you might be seeing some behavior stuff. Um, so here's, yeah, look at this for Carson, the amount of youth at risk for suicide, 300% increase over a two-year span, sharp decline in uh, bullying. So for Douglas County, though, interesting enough, and I don't know anything about this, I can't speak to this, but the, it actually, they saw a decrease in suicides in Douglas County. Um, and same with bullying or handle with care. And you're like, is it a decrease in reports or what is happening here? So this is more just like data to consider and we can always further uh, check out. For Lyon County, there was an increase in suicides for 121%. Uh, and unfortunately, Lyon County, they must have not had in 2019 data is what it looks like, but at least for the suicide piece. And then for bullying, there was a reduction. And again, you know, I don't know what is causing this. I'd say there's a reduce in bullying because they weren't in school in person. It's going to start to climb back up as people are back in school. When you're not with somebody, it's hard to be bullied, except of course, over the internet. That's, that is an issue, but I'd say that's a direct reflection of not being in class. Excellent. Yeah, that, that's very probably very true. Um, we also got Nye County data, so that's included as well. So reductions there, but you can see here this big increase in Carson and Lyon. And whether that's due to, I, I can't even speak to that, right? Maybe it's contagion with youth um, suicidal ideation. And then in Handle with Care, um, we had, it looks like we don't have Lyon County handle with care data. So, uh, but we do have Douglas, you see a reduction in those numbers. So again, unsure why there's those decreases. Bullying trends, like Dr. Titus said, may be directly influenced by, uh, you know, COVID. And that is it for that. But we're hoping to bring more data in front of you. I, you know, just looking around, I was actually thinking as we did this today, we didn't have time for reaching out to mobile crisis response and just seeing, you know, getting updates on their numbers as well. Any thoughts or questions on that before I move to the next one? Okay. So the other yes, one is yes. that. Sorry. This, go um, for it, share a I was just gonna, Yeah, I'm sorry, um, I couldn't get off mute and then it's, it's kind of lagged. Um, been having conversations with Desiree, Desiree Matisse who runs Safe Boys and um, not only are her, the kids back to kind of struggling again, um, the operators who are manning the phone lines and the text um, are hearing like higher crises more often. Wow now yeah. uh, recently and so even the operators are asking reaching out for help for themselves because our, our children are reporting um you know a lot more uh, bigger things and more more crisis um than than before and i do believe that um uh, titus was right when she said they were out of school so the bullying went down because they weren't in school and now kids are really struggling with now how do we remake friends when we've been out of school for so long. So we're kind of in this opposite bubble. And that's just, just having conversations with Desiree. Huh, okay, great. And we could invite Department of Education on again if you guys are ever interested in getting more information on that. Okay, so this next one was, I you were involved in this, the Regional Behavioral Health Survey. Um, and, Again, it's kind of like got these results. It's a work in progress. I would say it's iterative. Uh, we could absolutely plan to release the survey again this year. So we had 282 responses. Um, unfortunately, you're gonna see that a lot is heavily weighed towards Churchill County um, and Lyon County less for Carson and Douglas. Uh, and then yeah, Story County got 10%. So there, I am just gonna acknowledge some deviations that are going to occur to the, do this data. But I think in terms of a first step, at least we are, we can try and kind of maybe make a better attempt this next year with a data analyst or something. Way over representation of females. 
Uh, there were a lot of people who weirdly said, I prefer not to stay on gender. So I thought that was interesting. Like an extraordinary amount of people, like half. <laughs> In terms of age, we got some distribution, but obviously underrepresentation of youth. And I know we talked about having a youth one. So this is just something for the board to think about in terms of like, what do we want to do for this next year? Um, we did get some representation of Hispanic or Latino and then overrepresentation of American Indian, Native American. So uh, if you were or someone you care about was feeling a lot of stress, anxiety, depression, or experiencing a crisis or tragedy, would you know where to go for help? Um, it's a relatively high response, 72%, which I thought was interesting. And it could be, again, like we should really make sure that we're seeing if people are providers or community members in who took this survey. Um, but I would say that this is much higher than the rural region for whatever reason. If yes, would you know where to go to help for help? Please select all that apply. Uh, so that's interesting that, you know, there's like a whole mix of not just mental health, but that people would be utilizing all these. And something to think about is how to make these other alternate sources um, more skillful in responding to mental health. We've talked about that. Uh, do you feel enough support exists within your county to help people dealing with mental illness or emotional pain? Half and half. And then some people were like, I don't know. Are you satisfied with quality of care and support? Uh, the majority said yes, but there's a good chunk that said no. Do you feel like enough support uh, assists um, for substance misuse? And there's actually more people saying, no, there isn't for substance use versus mental health, right? What do you feel are the biggest factors keeping people from help? So this is interesting, this insurance piece. And Dr. Gunnarsson, I appreciate you giving feedback on that on the report. We'll talk more about this. So is there a barrier getting people in without insurance because we have the CCBHCs or is it an education gap so it's just something to consider to um, dig into that not having insurance and not having the right insurance definitely had a chunk. And then stigma or judgment was interesting, fear of legal consequences, wait times. Uh, where do you believe the local and st or state government should focus its energy, money and support on those with longer term distress, mental illness, substance use? So uh, it is provide services to those who can't afford treatment or have insurance at 68%. Connect community members struggling with right communities. Resources, 55%. Raising community awareness, 52%. The government shouldn't play a role was small. And then uh, other. So I just am sharing this through transparency. I know that it was not a great success, um, but I think that it was this pilot of just trying to kind of figure out how to do this. And I think that we could potentially get the buy-in with the state and sending it out through different mechanisms. Um, but at least it's some more information as we try to figure out data in the region. Thoughts on this that I didn't express? I think I would be really interested to know how many of them were professionals that worked in community-based services versus how many were community members. Because I wonder if that, you know what I mean? We, we live it every day, so we would know where to go, but does the general population know where to go? Right. I know for, so we use the coalitions to distribute this. And I know that like in Carson, they did it at an outreach event and actually just had like people at the outreach event fill it out. Um, so yeah, I think we would need a description of how all this is distributed to get an idea. Uh, professionals versus community members. And then there's our other things that we can do to improve. So I know that's not the focus of this meeting, but we got the results and then it's just something to think about for the next year. Yes, Marianne, we can sort of email that. And I think maybe just back to Laura's point, not not just the um, one way to get at that is is not get it knowing whether it's professionals or not. It's just adding that question. 
So it yes. would be good for us to have a sense of how it's distributed. But if we just added that as the question too, that might be um, surefire way as well. I agree with that. Yeah, that's what I was thinking too. And then the 2014 needs and gaps assessment for mental health. Uh, social entrepreneurs actually put out a survey with excellent questions that we saw after this survey. And so it would probably be worth not recreating the wheel and having a bunch of those questions to kind of see a time piece. Okay, well, thanks for letting me share kind of a quasi crappy survey. <laughs> But we will work on it moving forward. No, thanks. Thanks for that, Jess. So are we good with just um, moving in? Put, kind of putting that off to the side until next time? Yes. OK, perfect. Anyone's recommendations? I, that's the whole. So that's part of this agenda item is actually mm -hmm. developing the recommendations for the annual report. Yes. OK, cool. Okay, so uh, I sent this out just again for the sake of transparency to the region today. I got it down to 18 pages, which I feel kind of excited about. Uh, you'll see that it is a rough draft, but again, we're just trying to get board member uh, input. So you'll see, and I know that I took um, liberty in writing stuff down, just because as Eric Schoen said, I think you guys, he requested that there be a document for you guys to work with. So I just kind of threw stuff and then Taylor and I really worked on it to, um, you know, have the chair input. So um, this one I think is probably the most controversial, the board authority piece. Well, first of all, if I could just look, show you guys, if for those of you who haven't checked it out, down here on the activities, I think it was really interesting and important to review all the things that you guys have done over the past year. Um, you were actually, I would say, pretty productive, right? You reviewed the regional survey, you adopted the Northern Regional Emergency Operations Plan, you sent out a ton of advocacy letters for the legislature, um, got some education on important topics, you sent out other advocacy letters to DHHS. Uh, this actually happened. The board voted to send a letter to staff at DHHS to allocate workers for rural um, communities, and they did that for the rural hospitals. Um, yeah, and then so we talked about 988, the Regional Behavioral Health Authority. I'm just going over this to refresh your memory. Um, you talked about submitting a proposal to the American Rescue Plan, which we did, approved your bylaws, reappointed members, um, provided input for the website, uh, created that crisis response planning st statement, and then received more education. So with that in mind, and like we said, all of these are on the table, I guess, to be scrapped. So um, the first one is, um, the Regional Behavioral Health Authority and Dr. Gunnarsson wrote that no needs have been identified for that. Uh, I think we have discussed needs, but on the other hand, if it's not something that's important to you guys, we absolutely don't have to have anything here. I think you had the word above in there, which is what I was responding to that you might have taken out. Oh, okay. No, I think it was just yet. So I was like, uh, Right, so I, that's why I put further develop or adjust. So what are people's thoughts on, and just so you guys can see for strategies, exploration of regional behavioral health authority. So we talk about this idea of you guys like um, assessing, you know, exploring this concept of what it might look like. It shows, just so you're all aware, I put all, so that how I got it down to 18 pages is I put links to our website. And for the public to know, they are not up on the website, but they will be up by the time this paper is final. So Jessica, on this item, I do think, and again, I, I haven't been able to review it as of yet. It's been a really busy week for me, but um, we ended up, I mean, moving towards data-driven yes. um, information. We had a presentation on data, which came from this conversation as far as our authority as a board existing and the right. data suppository piece. So I do think yes, that- Do you want me to read it? Because it says that. 
does it? Yeah, it says while the behavioral, regional behavioral health authority and other concepts continue to be explored, the Northern Board is motivated to further develop current regional behavioral health policy board mandates, such as the electronic repository for behavioral health resources and data described in NRS. In which case, I think this is an applicable priority and strategy to this document as far as, I mean, it is something that we did within the last year. Okay, cool. So yeah, basically how you'll see this is that you've got the need and maybe we do need to write more on the need in terms of what we have here is several areas have been identified where additional infrastructure could lead to greater efficiency as the Northern region works to develop more sophisticated behavioral health systems. So we could either talk about this here or maybe you guys want to give me a couple ideas on sentences to of additional needs like because what Shayla said, should we explicitly say, for instance, really having access to um, like important data. I think one of the things that's throwing me off is just the, the exploration under strategy A, exploration of regional behavioral health authority has these three bullets underneath it. And I ah. think two bullets below that feel like separate, feel like yes. separate things. And so it's it's not that all of these are building towards that behavioral health authority, but that our, one of our strategies for infrastructure development is the possibility of this behavioral health authority and the data piece. And maybe the data piece gets separated out into its own. Yeah. I mean, it's, or actually the board support position seems like the data one too, right? I mean, because this is what yeah. we talk about. Well, and that's, you're so that. right. That was like a typo on my part. I think you're totally right. That like somehow those two got so one strategy was regional behavioral health authority the board support positions just so you guys can see um it says that we continue to advocate for the regional behavioral health coordinator um in addition the board was interested in obtaining a full-time data analyst position to assist the region in developing data collection systems for prioritized topics to make more data-driven decisions and then I put in parentheses, this position was recently obtained when the region received funding from the COSAP grant uh, submitted by the Attorney General's office, because I thought we could show that we're actually making progress, like we are empowered, we're not just asking for stuff. So thank you, Amy, for... Um, Wait, and I wonder if that piece, that, that last piece of the first bullet somehow gets integrated there as well. Okay. Because the data analysts will support support this, I would guess, right? Like we would have, it would be easier to build an electronic repository with a data analyst utilizing it and coaching people on how to use it and reaching out to them. So I think yeah. maybe that can go there too. Excellent. Okay. Oh, sorry. I don't know what happened. I'm just coming back to it. I think I accidentally, just one moment. Okay, awesome feedback, everyone. Thank you for being bold and courageous and giving feedback right here. Uh, I wanna make sure. Okay, awesome, okay. So the next one is the C, the Northern Region uh, Behavioral Health Emergency Operations Plan. So those are the strategies that you guys have looked at, at least this is what I'm writing for you, right? Um, that have been about infrastructure development of the board. That looks good. Okay, great. So then for recommendations, this is the fun part. So people have, already and i should let's see i think taylor came up with these suggestions further down in the document i tried to put initials next to suggestions so that you can see like who has emailed and i've included on so taylor had stakeholders in the region advocate for increased transparency coordination accountability for of behavioral health funding mechanisms recognizing limited capacity at the state level in addition the board recognizes the need to strengthen coordination of funding and programs between state and local stakeholders. Um, the other one she had was expand awareness and access of behavioral health first aid trainings. 
and for each county to formally adopt the Northern Regional Behavioral Health Operations, Emergency Operations Plan. So I just want to back backtrack on what I said prior. So that part about the data repository, maybe that goes in recommendations instead of on the strategy. I mean, it could probably go in both. Right. I mean, that's something that's part of the strategy that that we are looking forward to be doing. You know, we're recommending that we build this data repository. Maybe that's where it goes, if that's how we're. Okay, well, and yeah, maybe we could put it in. Okay, so maybe we just grab it from up here and put it down there. Um, so, but is that a recommendation? So that sounds like a plan. I guess what would be the recommendation if the governor was reading this or legislature or DHHS? So can they help us with developing us with a mandate to participate or I mean, I don't know if it needs to be a mandate, but they could um, use their advocacy voice to encourage people to participate in the repository. Right, I mean, it'll only ever be as good as the people that put data into it, right, or like the so it could be that the recommendation is like support our efforts to develop an electronic repository of health, a centralized repository of behavioral health resources and data, perhaps. Regional, I think is right. Because the state has a centralized repository now. So I'm just trying to clarify, right? Is that this mm -hmm. is more? I guess that's one thing that came out of our last meeting too, right? Like to what extent we really need the other repository now that we, like if we can navigate theirs, better to what extent do we need ours is that part of yeah but i don't asking? think that we can navigate there's i mean uh, um like the way to navigate the states is to email them on specific questions for data okay. and they also provide some data charts um so yeah, and so the board is mandated to have a data repository, right? And we have the website. So I'm just trying to help you guys out. So it would be to develop, further develop the data repository through DHHS staff partnering with us, maybe to share the data needed. I know it's tough. And we don't have to do this here, but at least we're going to take a stab at it. And then we have the next mm -hmm. month to really try to flesh this out. Mm -hmm. You know, one other thing that's super interesting, if I could bring this up. So um, my intern, Michelle Kirkland, who's here, we were talking about um, data and that a lot of the data that we are provided is pretty um, vague in terms of our priorities. And one strategy that would be very interesting is to actually try to capture the data from our priorities. So you have a priority for housing, really using that data analyst to say, these are the things that we are looking at in housing and developing plans to capture that. Same thing with workforce, you know, really developing the plan for like, this is how we're gonna get this workforce data. Here are the measures, and we've talked about this, um, because right now the state kind of has these vague surveys, like percentage of adults who um, feel poor mental health for 10 days or greater in your county. So I'm just throwing stuff out to try to keep the conversation going. Isn't that what Taylor was talking about at the last meeting that we had, is to take the data that we've received and then to lay that over our priorities and see what the gaps are. And then that would be our advocacy as far as I think um, filling in the gaps of that data. I think we've been presented at the last, um, I think it was the last meeting, the, there's a ton of data out there, but is it really aligned? And we really, I mean, we really need some help figuring out what's there that aligns with our goals and what's still missing. So is that part perfect? Thank you, Shayla. So with that, is that, is there a recommendation there for the state? to increase localized data based on our priorities that we still probably need to identify. I mean, we don't know which priorities are missing data at this point in time. Housing has data. I'm not sure if we have 
enough behavioral health housing data by locality for our region to really narrow that down. So are we looking for like assistance? I mean, recommendations are hard. And the other thing Taylor wanted to say is there might be stuff that you guys don't have recommendations on. So it's kind of like- I would say that overall, we are lacking localized data. What we get, and some of the data we've seen has been amazing, but getting it localized by county and then by our specific region is hard. We have to kind of generalize that, yeah, we're a part of the rural area as a lot of the information comes out Washoe Clark rural but we're the northern region. So what does that look like? And some data was able to do that for us and some data was not. Right. And I wonder if we could even put this in towards the crisis response system, you know, saying like in such efforts as the crisis response system, stakeholders really talked about wanting to have data built into that when they develop it, right? That you guys can get. Yeah, so Jessica, you can take that part out, the, the top part, and put it back where it was. I was just thinking if we're, I was thinking of recommendations in terms of like recommendations for ourselves of like what we're working on next, you know? So it probably makes better sense to leave it up there and then have it as Shayla has suggested, you know, yeah. support with local data. Cool. And I think also just thinking about this, like funding recommendations, you know, like when we, the legislature, when they come out, they do ask like the regional coordinators to be like, what are funding recommendations? I think we went through that last year. So just considering that too, in developing these. Okay. So support need for local data aligned with Northern board priorities. Is everyone feeling confident on that one? Mm -hmm. Cool. What about the ones that Taylor proposed? Do you like this? This is hard. Is this something that's actionable? I'm not sure. I mean, probably. I think you could probably just take that in addition, Northern Morton recognizes, like take that part out and then put a bullet right before strengthen. And one of the recommendations is strengthen coordination of funding and programs between state and local state stakeholders. I mean, even if the state does have not, does not at this current time have the capacity to make, you know, build those bridges between all the different people that they're funding, that doesn't mean they'll never be at that point. Um, and it's, it's just a recommendation. And you know, there are organizations that do like really sophisticated funders, that, not necessarily at state level, but like in kind of the private sector that connect all of their grantees and get them all talking to each other and figuring stuff out. And that's not, I think, something that is impossible, although it does take time. Should we tie it back to that first statement or do you think we could put this somewhere else? I think it's fine where it is. Okay. And you know, my comment, this is Nikki on strengthening coordination of funding and programs. This happens in other programs. Like a very good example is um, tobacco control and prevention. They, um, they get together, they um, talk about the funding. Um, they work as a state on a lot of different campaigns and program objectives. So it definitely can be done. Hmm. And do you wanna give that example of something like tobacco or do you think that this is enough? I think this is enough because, I mean, we could explain further if they needed it, but um, I, think, I think this is enough here.
Um, one thing is, is that we have up above under board support positions, we have that we continue to advocate for sustainable funding um, for Jessica's position. Um, so should that be carried down into the recommendations as well? I mean, I think it should be. So okay. I think that makes a ton of sense, Laura. I Great call. Yeah. Uh, and I do believe that the state is potentially planning to write, I don't know, they've talked about this for a long time, but write our rules into, uh, to, into law, maybe with the boards, which would then create that. So that could happen in the next legislative session. Okay, anything else on this recommendation? Great. Okay, moving on to the next one. So affordable and supportive housing and other determinants of health. So I just threw out like that we're experiencing many individuals who have behavioral health issues and are homeless. These individuals with complex needs deteriorate on the street or become stuck in hospitals or jails for long periods of time with no safe discharge plan available. In addition, the board sees a gap in resources to address social determinants of health. Um, should I add anything? Does that feel accurate to the situation? I think it looks good. Uh, Nikki, I think you're on mute. But I'm interested in what you have to say. Gosh, you would think I would learn this by now. Um, I think we need to add something in there about the lack of supportive housing okay. within um, our area. Like a severe lack or just a lack of supportive housing? It's a, well, a severe lack. Yeah. There's a not. Gap that in I know. Housing. Yeah, is there any supportive housing? I guess, what about uh, Richard's Crossing? Is that an example of supportive housing? I don't feel it is. Okay. Because they're taking, um, you know, there is some case management over there that I understand, but, you know, that's a HUD funded. So they take individuals from all over and it's not taking them from these programs yeah. in which they're in and putting them into some type of housing to keep them on track. Right, so there is no supportive housing for local and residents in the region. And I would say towards mental health because there are transitional housing programs such as community counseling center, like they're developing more transitional housing, right? but it's not really focused on mental health and substance use. Well, and it's not focused on those individuals that need that support in a um, living environment. Yeah. What do you think about there's no supportive housing for local, like aligned with best practice as well? Because this whole like housing that. first thing is I think necessary and our region has not gotten to housing first yet, right? So am I offending like anyone? You like that? Mm -hmm. uh, it's an example of one of the gaps in resources. Yeah. So it fits with the prior sentence. Okay, great. Okay, and then the strategies. So this is one that's like kind of in process, right? The board is motivated to learn about and advocate for housing models that support individuals with behavioral health issues. The board heard a presentation, developed a subcommittee, plans to have a uh, presentation in the future. Are there recommendations that you might consider? We can be general about it, but I think part of the reason why we had the subcommittee was to develop specific recommendations. So um, I think in a, in a general way, right? I mean, we don't have this, we need it, but it, I think that we knew that 
when we talked about writing the letter and at that stage we're like this isn't specific enough yeah and you know what that subcommittee actually is before the next board meeting so it's potentially that you could take the, those recommendations one just talking to kirsten Colomb. It's just making sure that they're considering our region in developing 1915i or what it looks like taking your input into account or something. But so yeah, okay, we can follow up with this in March, right? And so the subcommittee mentioned here is gonna be looking into uh, models of this type of housing in other states is my understanding. Is that what we thought we talked about? Okay. Yes, that's correct. I was trying to remember one. When I lived in Fargo, North Dakota, they had something like this right downtown. This, I don't know what, who bought it. It might have been the state, but they bought an old building. And on the bottom floor was social services. Um, and on the top floor is for apartments. Yes, that is what, when I was talking to Ariana Saunders, and if you guys come to the meeting, that's what she describes as like the mm -hmm. best practice, is giving individuals their own space and then having supportive housing like on, on site. Cool, so we'll learn more about that. Does anyone wanna add any other recommendations or you guys are happy with that? Okay, cool. Okay, behavioral health workforce with capability to treat adults and youth. The Northern region faces significant barriers caused by a lack of behavioral health workforce and difficulties. Behavioral health professionals encounter becoming in work providers for insurance reimbursement caused by lack of workforce and difficulties uh, in, oh, that behavioral health professionals encounter in becoming in-network providers for insurance reimbursement. This gap impedes timely access to treatment and prevents providers from expanding quality services. How does everyone feel about this need and gap? I know psychologists complain about the paneling all its frequently. And Dr. Gunderson, you might have put something there, and I put it on a recommendation, or is that something that you want to add right here? Well, no, there was a couple of spots that have seemed relevant, so it's like, whatever you think it would fit the best, that's what I would put in. Okay, I think that could be a recommendation piece to consider, but for the needs and gaps, do you think it covers the need and gap? Yeah, those two things go hand in hand. There's you know, one of the complaints is well, there's a lot of psychologists that could see people, but there's no, you know, they can't get reimbursed, so people can't get a psychologist. And so there's this wait time, and people have room. You know, we could we'll get you in the door if you could pay for it. Wow, that's really under yeah. need, under needs and gaps under strategies. We talk about peer support and CHWs. We should probably have something under needs and gaps that addresses that so it aligns with the strategies. Um, I have no idea what that would be, but I'm just throwing it out there. Well, so the way I wrote it was that like, since we have this gap, I just said from where the board came from, right? That you've got a gap in workforce and part of what the board has considered a solution is maybe to use more CHWs and peers. But if you think that I should add something to needs and gaps, I'm happy to on that. No, it makes sense now. I get it. Or we could just say that we have underutilization of community health workers and peers. Does that I make think sense? that would be good? Yes. Okay, so I could put in addition the region or the Northern Board, so this is for all of you to agree on. The do Northern we, Board believes, yes. I was just gonna say for CHWs, do we, I, and I, yeah, uh, are they underutilized or are they, is it that we haven't developed that workforce yet? Like, I don't know that we have a ton of CHWs available to do this work. That's a different thing than like the psychologists that are available, but there's the insurance gap. I think with the CHWs, they're underutilized by the state in the sense that the state hasn't put a lot of infrastructure and support around developing that piece of the workforce. So I think yeah. however we word it, we I think we want to make sure that we're saying 
we've already got this group over here and they've got insurance barriers. And then we have these other solutions that work well in other states, but we haven't put enough funding and infrastructure to like build those people up here. Yeah. So what do you think about like um, CHWs and peers like still need to be developed or need to be further developed or promoted? Go for it, Dr. Gunderson. I just said prom promoted might be the word you could use. The, you know, the development of this class of providers should be promoted. I guess that's and, a recommendation, but. Yeah, so that's what I would say would be a, a recommendation. Yeah. I would say that the profession of CHWs and peers has not been um, fully I don't know, maximized or not been fully developed and utilized. Are you guys okay with that? I would agree with that because while there was a lot of legislative work that went into allowing them to be billable, there's very little that's been done to aid providers in actually figuring that mechanism out. So it was, um, it was an inch, but it wasn't the full bridge. Cool. Yeah, and I, I agree with that. There was a ton of discussion on what they are, but not how we get them. And, you know, was it how we're gonna pay for them and what may the roles be, but we haven't really seen any further push on actually utilizing them and, and educating them and seeing a role with that. So I think it's really important that it, it continues to um, be recognized that we need to move forward with it. I agree with that. Excellent. Great, guys. So under the, to that point, under the recommendations, we should probably put something. So um, like the Healthy Communities Coalition yeah. is, doing a, is doing a lot of that work. I think right. I got an email from them that they had had like 400 times the registration for their CHWs and they don't charge for those or for like the CHW training um, because that's grant funded, but they're trying to like figure that piece out. So um, totally agreed with what everyone said. We have, we haven't, we haven't had enough of that support, right? There's, right. And so lifting up and like supporting the agencies that are trying to build that infrastructure for the rest of us, okay. like they're working on a um, employer support training. They haven't been able to deliver it yet, but they're working on it, you know? And so there's, I guess, um, this reminds me a little bit of the discussion about supporting the local first, right? Like there are local agencies working on it. So so as you develop solutions at the state level, continue to work with those local partners. Okay, so support local agencies facilitating CHW and peer workforce development. Yeah, I think that I think that would be a good recommendation. Development in um, in assisting communities, or sorry, or do you think I, it's peer I think that's fine, just the way it is. Cool. Awesome. Um, just so aside, I heard that you could Medicaid is going to start enrolling CHWs for Medicaid reimbursement. Uh, is it March 22nd? February 22nd. Yeah, 22nd or 23rd. Thanks. Yeah. And so potentially uh, we'll talk more about board items, but like you just said, the CHW organization could come present to us. Okay. Um, so Dan or Dr. Gunnarsson, you put promoting legislation that simplifies application insurance paneling process. Yeah, so, I haven't gone through that a couple of times. It's a you know, ream of paper about as thick as an old phone book. Okay. It's just, it's just uh, onerous to go through. It, it just seems ridiculous. So, so I just put that in there as a suggestion, something you guys can think about, but that's my experience. Just, it takes, you know, it's like a second job just to get that done. Right. What that about was my experience? So I'm just going on my own experience. Okay. And I put support legislation that simplifies. Um, and then, so you were saying that that's a workforce issue that like insurances are not paneling enough providers potentially that are limiting. Yeah, it artificially reduces the number of uh, providers available because they, they can't provide people that don't have insurance. Does that make sense? Can you say that again? But then it artificially reduces the number of available providers because it disallows people without insurance to see the people that might be in their area. Maybe they have an insurance that the, the provider 
um, or that insurance that isn't accepted by that provider or the provider hasn't been paneled by that yes. insurance. Right. So um, would you recommend that the state investigate ways to, I think this has been a major issue in urban counties and I don't know what the strategies in, in the, the next month we could look at what, you know, cause they talk a lot about this with Medicaid managed care that they artificially reduce the choices that you have for providers. So I don't know, what would you like Dr. Gunnarsson on this part or board members? Do you guys have thoughts? Yeah, I've given you my idea why I would put this in there. Because this is, like I said, it's an onerous process and it, it just takes forever to get done. And then uh, people get denied for no apparent reason. And could we just put clinical insurance paneling process? I'm not sure if that's a term insurance companies use. But. Hey, Jessica, this is Elise. Can I jump in? Yeah. Well, so, no, uh, Allie, it's up to Chair Bannister. <laughs> Okay. I was actually just reading your um, your message in chat. Yes, please go, Elise. Elise, we'd like to hear your feedback. So when I was in the governor's office there, the Division of Insurance had a network adequacy work group, and they, I can't remember what happened with that, but it sounds like this is a network adequacy issue or can be framed that way. So that might be something to look at. I don't remember what, like I said, what happened with the division of insurance, but I just remember going to work groups when I was with the gov. Yeah, that's like the right um, word for it, right? Is like insure network adequacy for like private insurance providers or something, right? Or yeah, all? so it, it looks like Leah Case might, um, Ah. might currently attend those. Oh, and she is awesome and had a link. So that might be something you guys want to look at. Um, For future, yeah. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Yeah, is, there, is there something you wanted to chime in on? I know that you put that in the chat. Thank you. Hi, no, um, nothing I really wanted to chime in on. Just I've been following those network adequacy issues for a long time. That council, um, that Elise mentioned, they do only affect um, the small group health plan. So it's like 20% of the insured in the state, uh, but they have been working a little more closely with like Medicaid. And I know that there's some kind of crossover there with that SB 420 public option development. Um, so I think they're, you know, they, they currently only affect a small group, but I think their voices are getting louder, if that helps. So what do you guys think about put an explore recommendation for network adequacy and we have a month to mull this over? I think that sounds good. Okay. Hey, okay. Just real quick, not to backtrack, but to backtrack, <laughs> sorry. On the CHWs, one thing to highlight here um, would be that the legislation currently um, prohibits the use of CHWs for behavioral health. So yeah. even though their Medicaid, the CHWs will become Medicaid billable, they won't become Medicaid billable for, billable for behavioral health services. And yeah. so that would be, I think, a recommendation we should consider. Yes. And maybe learning more about that, because I heard that part of it is because the funding wasn't there, but, yeah. but then the other piece I heard was that there was there was concern that with the peer support coming in yeah. as well, that we need to be really clear on who's doing what kind of thing. Absolutely. So Eric put this in, expandability of CHWs to bill for Medicaid out from under only a medical provider and then expand, he said IE, but I think this is and, expand to include any all behavioral health substance use providers. So are you guys aligned with that? Um, I think that's yeah. smart. Um, I think we should, uh, just from my perspective, I do think we should do that. Like even for us, we're a hospital, but we're like, oh, I can't supervise our new CHWs and get billed for Medicaid, right? We have to go get like one of our nurses to supervise them, um, which, you know, that, that makes good sense, you know, but at the same time, there are people who are very qualified to su supervise that work that may not be clinicians. Right. Yeah. I think that's been a big one that I've heard from a lot of stakeholders. The other thing about this is that on our actions list is to define, I was just talking to Laura about this today, is to define the roles between peers and CHWs. 
and really be like, this is, and I'm sure it's in research. It wouldn't be us recreating the wheel, but just really being clear on those two roles. Well, and I think the importance of both to the system, um, that they both have a position in the system or a place. Um, uh, I don't know, can I throw in a recommendation? Is that- Yeah, well, what about what you just said? Are you gonna talk about that? Cause I think that is, well, go for it, it. What's your recommendation? So I guess basically what I'm saying is that we put a lot of emphasis on CHWs um, and it almost feels like we're saying CHW, CHWs, oh, and peer support. And that it's kind of an add-on that we're just putting in there because we need to have peer support in, but it doesn't seem like we're really looking at what we can do to expand peer support in the region. And I think that that's, I think that's an important component that we need to not lose sight of. Um, I also think that one of the challenges for our peer support development workforce is the cost of getting certified. The wages are still fairly low and it is more expensive to get certified as a peer support specialist, I believe, than a CHW. So that is a barrier that we could potentially look at as well um, regarding is there anything advocacy wise we could do regarding how much the certification to be able to work costs? So that was my recommendation. So two of them, what I hear is, yeah, so let's really develop that first recommendation. Ensure that both CHW, ensure uh, clear differentiation of roles between CHW and peers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And peer roles, and then there's like an and there, and ensure that they're both implemented in appropriate settings or appropriate ways. What do you guys think? Because Laura, you really have been in the kind of had your hands in all this for a while, right? Yeah, I would say to ensure that they're being utilized within their appropriate scope of work. Maybe use scope of practice instead. That's a more common phrase. Is that good for everyone? Okay, and then the second one was about funding. Is it for peers? Reduce funding barriers to get peers certified or for peer certification? Yeah, and, and the CHW, I believe, is a little cheaper, but that's still a barrier um to people being able to get in the field when they're just starting out it especially is for peers because a lot of times peers may not have been working for a while and are just re-entering the workforce so there there is expense that we're losing staff potential staff that could be really valuable to our system by that financial barrier Okay, I'll put financial. Address financial barriers to CHW and peer training and certification process. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and then we have Eric's expandability for CHWs to bill for Medicaid under blah, blah, blah. We already talked about that one. Okay, and then uh, I'm going to put this at the bottom. Eric also has increased reimbursement rates for all mental health professionals, professions, and affiliated professions that we want more of in Nevada to attract more workforce. We could reword it, but what do you guys think? Needed. No, I wouldn't put needed in because that then begs for an argument who's needed and who isn't. Right, that we lack in workforce, lacking in workforce. I'm just throwing things on the paper, guys. Hmm. 
do people agree with this concept in general? And it's just the wording that's freaking people out. I or agree with the concept. Like, Sheila, you said you like the concept. I, I, I mean, I think we've been talking about reimbursement rates across the board. Um, I think we've talked a lot about the need for it. I think it's more perhaps mental health professions with low, um, it's not operating, but like, because we have a lot of folks that are registered or licensed, but not necessarily people that are working in our region. So I think it's the professions that have um, low fill in the blank word rate in the rural areas or the um, areas experiencing or, shortages, something like that. Throw get shortages in there. In the northern region, yeah. Like hard to recruit regions or something like that. Well, what's the term? The underserved regions. Is it underserved? Oh, underserved. Yeah, I was trying to remember the, the phrase it's used. Because that is exactly what is, he, you're getting to, Shayla, is it's actually not how many you have. Like, I think there's like 100 psychologists in Douglas County. That's a little bit of a overstatement, but like half of them or 75% are retired. I mean, there's really kind of this outrageous number because all these retired psycholo psychologists moved to Douglas. Have you it's guys like heard active, about this? Active workforce or something like, yeah, there's some way to describe it that it's You've got the concept right and the increase in the reimbursement rate is right but how we describe the area of need is where i think we're hung up on yeah in areas that are underserved and have low rates of active workforce or something yeah yeah that's kind of redundant though do you think underserved is enough? But but okay. the problem is for all behavioral health professions, but we're looking at the specific professions of those providers, active providers. You know what I mean? It's like where there are low rates That's definitely closer. Mm -hmm. Okay. And you could put, yeah, low rates or low, well, low rates, uh, I, where there's a low ratio of active providers to population. Oh, totally. Because that's actually how they measure that. Do you guys, are you guys good with that? I'm sorry, just out of curiosity, do we, are we making recommendations for the whole state or for our region? Region. So perhaps. To providers in the northern region. Right. And I actually think we've had conversations about increasing rates for rural versus others. So that it would make sense. Yes. Cool. And change R to okay. is to keep their verb tense correct here. Oh, sorry about that. Unless you want to put low ratios. You got to switch one. Either the R becomes an is uh, or the uh, becomes ratio. Does this look good? Yeah. By the way, Dr. Gunnarsson and Nikki Aker are superstars with proofreading. And I just really am deeply grateful to both of you. So thank you for your <laughs> well, we sharing. Sti we have slight stylistic differences, but we're on the same track. <laughs> I love it. I mean, really, you're like sharing your superpower with me. So thank you. OK. Uh, so then we have increased reimbursement rates and or supplemental rate for those practitioners providing services in rural counties. Oh, so that speaks to, but that's not just about low workforce. This is like actually trying to draw people out to the rural counties. And what this is also about, I'm, I'm sure you guys already know, but I'm just trying to speak to people who may be new, is about driving times low client ratios per providers, you know, it's like actually creating a higher reimbursement for the difficulty in providing services in the rural area. And this came from Eric again. I think there's another and or in there, or it's a separate column, but we've also talked about incentives outside of the reimbursement rate, such as like 
covering the cost of education or reimbursement for the certification if you commit so much time to the rural area. Okay, increased reimbursement rates and other incentives for providers, oh, for pr practitioners providing services in rural counties? Right, I think the reimbursement is, is answered by the one above. And you're talking about some, you know, it's basically saying the same thing because these underserved uh, low, low ratio places are going to be in the rural counties. We know that. So I think that's a little... I think you could just put increase you know, other incentives for practitioners providing services in rural counties because you're talking about reimbursement in the bullet point above. Ah, what that's do you how that reads to me anyway. It's again a bit redundant. Well, I think one it seems like is talking about based on the ratio, and one is just talking about a geographic area. So it would seem that we yeah. want to increase. I'd be surprised, if those, yeah. I'd be surprised if those two things weren't the same. That you'd end up with the same map if you looked at them. I mean, maybe not, but that, that would be my, my assumption that you're going to see this the map overlap. Okay. What do you guys think? You want to pull out one or take out reimbursement rates, as Dr. Gunnarsson suggests? Or do you want to keep both? I agree with taking out the reimbursement it. rates and just having other incentives. Because okay. I do agree that we've covered the reimbursement rates above. Awesome. Okay. I would agree. And then I'd also say it might be not necessarily increasing other incentives if we're not being specific, but it might be exploring. Yeah, there could be like, like uh, he mentioned bonuses or something I thought was in there. It could be like a, a bonus or some other type of incentive, you know, say for a year or three years, you get, you know, some uh, longevity bonuses like the state does for people or used to do anyway. What about explore additional incentives? Yeah, that's a good word too. You know, cause we're, there's already incentives so we want more, right? Okay. Cause maybe it could be loan forgiveness. Right, and there is loan forgiveness in our region, isn't mm -hmm. there? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Oh, right. So you're saying that that exists, but then like, what else could we do or make it easier for providers to use it? Okay. Awesome. And I don't know, you know, in, I'd have to look up in what areas they're doing the loan forgiveness and maybe we need to look at that. Does it need to be expanded? I was just thinking that. So ideally what I think about these recommendations is wouldn't it be cool to be very specific and actually have a solution like I could have one of my interns explore what other states do for incentives or something. And then we could go look at these incentives, ABC. I mean, because really, if you think about these recommendations, I feel like if I was reading it, I'd be like, yeah, I agree. I don't know what to do about this either, you know? Um, so maybe, yeah. This is Lana at New Frontier. Um, we actually are participating in the National Health Service Corps loan or tuition reimbursement. And they've expanded some of the areas that um, they're now including uh, substance use uh, counselors. Um, there, there was uh, something that came out that um, they were going to be looking at the potential for peers um, also. Uh, I don't know how that's gonna fit necessarily because the majority of the requirement is master's level um, and already uh, licensed, no interns. Um, so I'm not exactly sure how some of their ideas are going to play out. But I do think that it's worth looking at. They also have uh, the loan re uh, tuition reimbursement in Nevada. Um, so there's a state program and then there's the HRSA program uh, nationally. Right, so there's all those things, but we still aren't getting providers. So is there anything else that we could do, you know? I mean, Lana, you're involved in that and you don't have enough providers. I was no, I can't beg, borrow, or steal one. So, <laughs> and I've been on the, the tuition reimbursement train for several years now and that, um, that it brought one individual in, uh, a therapist, 
who within less than four or five months went to rural clinics. Um, so that was a bust for me. But um, yeah, I mean, I would think that that would be an amazing opportunity for people. Um, yeah. But they have a limited one of the ways, though, is you may get them to expand the window of um, in the ability to be able to fill out an application um, as a provider um, because they only have this little dinky window um, for becoming a provider agency and becoming um, a, an actual provider um, therapist. Uh, and if they would just keep it open all year long, I think they might get more participants. I don't, or more agencies wanting to participate. Yeah. That's an option. Okay, cool. So I'm going to put these two as like things that we can maybe dial in a little bit more. I also heard that the um, HRSA application is very difficult. Now, I don't know anything about that, but Lana, maybe you do. I apologize, I missed that question. I had heard that the HRSA application is very difficult to complete. Well, talking as a provider, uh, you know, about four years ago or whatever, I thought it was um, not as much difficult as unclear in the directions. Um, I think once um, the gentleman from the state of Nevada helped me understand what they were actually asking for, it became very easy. So I do think that they can clear up some of the language there um, to make it a little bit easier to fill out the application. Their site is, the HRSA NHSC site is very difficult to maneuver around in. Um, they have um, a ton of stuff out there. Some of it is really extraneous and doesn't really need to be there. I think that they think uh, more is better. Um, but, um, and I haven't done any provider applications, so um, I can't answer about the providers, but if they made it difficult for uh, agencies uh, to participate, um, I'm sure it's probably some hurdles for the applicants as well. And right. if you don't get it right and the window closes, you're just kind of foobar. Yeah. I mean, I guess we could, I was just like, ah, oh, federal agency. I mean, we could potentially like write a letter to HRSA and just be like, hey, we actually care about this. Can you fix this? Well, I think the gentleman's name in Nevada is Joseph Tucker. Ah. I believe. Okay. And he yeah. handles, so I have... I have one staff person who is under the state and one who is un one contractor, um, half-time employee who is under the national site. So okay. I kind of have my foot in both camps. But he's right. the one, he is the one that helped me maneuver through getting uh, approved. Okay. So we will keep this on here, Lana. Maybe I can have more conversation with you. I mean, this either could be a board strategic plan or maybe the letter needs to get written or maybe it also ends up on here and we find other strategies. Okay, awesome conversation. Uh, and then Eric also has increased reimbursement rates and or add supplemental rate for nurses and others who provide home health care. So home health care agencies can offer wages competitive with that of hospitals. Right now, nurses are disincentivizes disincentivized from doing health home health because hospitals are able to provide higher wages but it's burden of stress of caregiving on families and caregivers i mean you could potentially say that this is behavioral health because of the stress on caregiving families and caregivers <clears throat> so what do you guys think i think this fits under social determinants of mental health huh I think you're right. Health, with nursing you, care, you know, having you uh, access to care. So it fits with that overall picture. What do you guys think? I think that's kind of brilliant. Well, that's a little excessive. I don't think so. <laughs> what do you guys think? 
Are you cool? I mean, that actually fits, which is nice. I guess I was kind of like, I guess we can let that slide, but that actually fits there. So I guess that's why I felt like it was brilliant, Dr. Gunnarsson. I'm not just shining you on here. Okay, so do does anyone else have any burning recommendations that they want to put on here for now? And the other thing is, is this is open. Email me and I'll put it on this document and keep sending it out to you guys. If like tomorrow you're like, oh, that is what I want. How about uh, loan forgiveness and a housing stipend? Ooh, yeah. Well, let's put that as in the IE for consideration. Um, I, I just wanted to add something to what Dr. Gunnarsson has said. I do think it makes sense um, to go under social determinants in the sense that um, if you have an environment where it's a family member who is the primary caregiver, that may impact your access to care, right? Or the access to services. But then another way of thinking about it too, or an additional layer of that is that if we're thinking about the mental health of the caregiver, then they kind of become the primary there. And it's not about their determinants necessarily, but just like what services are we offering for that caregiver as a, you know, individual with like behavioral health needs. And so I guess what I was thinking about under that, similar to how we're saying advocating for like resources for CHWs, resources for peers, maybe like more respite care, maybe um, like more, I don't know, education support training on like how to take care of yourself as a caregiver. I don't know if that- Yes, for social- that, It's exactly good. But I think that makes sense. We never talk enough about respite, but where does it go? I think you're right. I think it's, it's almost like, I mean, I guess it depends how you define workforce, but like caregivers are workforce, right? And so to a certain extent, like they're one more piece of the, of the, yeah, I guess in, in one way of looking, they're one more piece of the behavioral health workforce. And the social okay. determinants piece comes in when you're thinking about um, for an individual who needs that care, um, if their caregiver doesn't have those additional supports, they may be disadvantaged to get access. I don't know if I'm making Okay, that. cool. I was also thinking, is it also levels of care, like the care system respite? That's where I would think it would go, especially with like, including in like the peer drop-in centers, living room models, community support centers, and respite care. Okay, so I'm just going to put that down because you obviously have that developed. What do you guys think, like putting that there for now? What is it? So it would be... Well, you have a sentence here under strategies, that last sentence in strategies. Oh, ah, good catch, Laura. And what do you think about putting increased funding options for respite, increased funding for? Do we currently have any funding options for respite? So would it be increased or would it be develop? Designate? I'll put develop. <laughs> for... And then we can go back up, Amy, I'm fine with putting respite all over this thing. I was just trying to grab like the actual service, right? Respite care, peer drop-in centers, living room models, and community support centers. Okay, and then, so Amy, I guess going back to what you were saying, with respite and family caregivers with workforce. That's what you're saying, right? Is That's just what, I mean, just in reading Eric's suggestion about the, the nursing, um, you know, shifting the, the funding for nurses, I think that makes really good sense and to keep it there. And it just made me think about the, that other piece of that, which is that when you're a caregiver, a family, you know, when it's falls to you as a family member to give that care, like there is a, a substantial, like mental health burden, I would say, for a lot of folks who don't necessarily know where to access support or don't have access to respite care, or maybe I don't actually know what is available. I've heard people tell me there's not a lot, but that's anecdotal. So I can't say, you know, how much we have or what we don't have, but I do know that people have shared that, oh my gosh, there's just nowhere I can take my son or there's, um, I got to go get off work now because I got to go help my grandma, you know? Um, yeah. 
So while we're talking about the workforce, we could just think about caregivers as part of the workforce. Yeah. So we moved Eric's thing though, up to social determinants of health with the health care. And Jessica, on that one that you're just typing, can you put across the lifespan? Because we need those kind of services for families of youth, families of adults. And so I think it's important that we we look at both categories. But I think you're right. I mean, Amy's got a point. I don't know what to do. We could put this under actually workforce because family caregivers could be considered workforce. I mean, there has actually been discussions about paying family caregivers. Like, why are we just like having them do it? You know, that's exactly what I was going to bring up is, um, you know, if there could be some type of payment to these individuals, because, you know, maybe they are there, you know, the individual is a full time job trying to take care of but they're having to go outside the home for employment and then either leaving the individual alone or trying to re rely on somebody else. Yeah. Say, yeah. In certain circumstances. That's cool. And go ahead. I'll finish. Under certain circumstances, oh. developmental services does uh, uh, have what we call a host home arrangement where family members will be paid to oh. take care of their, their child or their adult child. So there's a precedent for that in our side of the, of the services. The other thing that I want to throw out there is that um, while it's not respite and indirect with this, but ADSD, Aging and Disability Services Division, homemaker program, this next grant cycle is going to be experimenting with self-directed um, pay for family caregivers for homemaker services. So they are, the state and other arenas are working towards that direct payment for, um, you know, chosen caregivers versus licensed caregivers, since it's becoming more and more difficult to even find individuals that are able to just come out and do that homemaker service to keep older adults in their homes longer. So um, it, it, I mean, respite workforce is terrible, but but there is definitely some mechanisms being built for that piece and they call it self-directed. I love that. I actually heard that in California. I mean, we are light years behind because in California, individuals do get a chunk of money for their care based on their acuity and they get to just choose how, like what services they have, how they come in, all that stuff. <coughs> That's awesome. And I actually heard that this was a huge need in the governor's listening tour um on caregivers not just for child that was definitely a big one but we're seeing that in elderly so excellent cool well and it's also the the caregivers of families who have an adult loved one with serious mental illness a lot of times they're they're having those same challenges as if they were caring for a child or an elderly parent so i think that's important for us to remember too Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I know that this is like tedious maybe, but these recommendations are better than ever because you're all participating in them. So I'm just so grateful for uh, this time. Okay. So are we good with, uh, let's see, we skipped around a little bit. So behavioral health workforce, is there anything you guys want to add for now or moving on? Okay. Okay. So number four, development of regional crisis response system. Obtain sustainable funding for current crisis stabilization and jail diversion programs. Uh, I almost think we eventually need to just like word this differently. I think we smushed an existing priority into this one. Would you say it's like development of a regional crisis system while obtaining sustainable funding for current crisis and stabilization programs? I think this needs to be connected probably to the letter we wrote in response to the 988 infrastructure that was being built. Yes, I wrote it down here. The, wrote, okay. the board wrote a position statement on behalf of the region, which can be found here. And it's not there yet, but I'm telling you, we're just gonna pack the Northern website with like all of your advocacy letters and everything. 
is do you think that's high enough up though amy or do you want it like right at the top or a strategy i just think that um that the way the the i love how it's written i mean i feel like it's very clear it's very succinct it gets at our goals it's just i i almost feel like it could have been written this way before we had the 988 conversation and now we know that's coming and we know that we have to really push to be integrated and so I think however we word it, it's like our recommendation source. Okay. So it's the, the goal is this, our needs and gaps strategy is, I think the strategy then, well, okay. Or the recommendation. I think the recommendation is like that paper, but you're right. I mean, I probably wrote it too vague, so I'm happy to get input onto like how to make this more dialed, like even I don't think it's too vague. I think it's very clear. I think it has everything you need in it. I just think it feels disconnected from the conversation that we know is being had of there is now this state process of a crisis response system and how does our region tie into it? And so especially like, I don't know that we, you know, as you said before, sometimes they get the report, they never read them. It sits on a desk. So if it's through a link, no one's going to go look at that extra paper we wrote. Totally. So the need we could say is that like the region, the state is developing. I could delete all this, right? No, 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 no. Don't do that. Don't do that. I'm not saying delete it. Okay. That's not what but I'm you're, saying. But you're so right though, that I'm like saying, I actually thought this when I wrote it, I was like, everyone knows that there's these individuals experiencing crisis. Like we've been working on this, but the real need that you're talking about is the need for the region to be able to provide input and create a system that's like based on their values or whatever, right? I think just leave it, leave this part and then below it, like how okay. it says, okay, so these were developed in river, how do they not currently have sustainable fighting more crisis response? Okay, so um, that's, that's the need. And then the next need on that same thing could just say something like, um, with the implementation of 988, there's a need to coordinate the local infrastructure with what the state is developing. Just a suggestion. Like local infrastructure or local stakeholder needs or input into what the state's developing? What did I you say, say like the local infrastructure because you described all of what we built right and what the yeah. regions built so with the implementation of 98 there's a need there's also a need I wouldn't even say also just like there is a need okay. to coordinate local infrastructure into the state solution or I don't know that sounds terrible I wouldn't use that actually but it's the crisis state. response system yeah there we go Okay, and we'll just leave it out there, like in its own uh, one sentence paragraph, don't you think? Because it's like an important part. Awesome, cool. Okay, so progress is being made in obtaining. Sorry, Jessica, maybe on that one um, sentence statement, maybe you put a link to our letter. Right here, yes. I could put please see here for the northern regions crisis response uh, position statement. Well, the other thing is if you guys, because I actually think that was an excellent document, we could just copy and paste the whole thing in here. If you were like, this is something that we strongly believe, like we could have that here. We only, it's only 18 pages. And actually I'm gonna delete a bunch of the data at the bottom too. So I'm just gonna highlight this and then I'll put the piece there. So consider that as we move forward. I mean, the recommendation, we could copy and paste that letter right here. And just say, this is from the position statement it's 18 pages long. Oh no, this is 18 pages long. The other thing is not 18 pages long, right? No, so it's like two pages long. Right. I was like, I wouldn't copy another 18 pages in here. No one will read it, but if it's shorter than, yeah, I think that's good. Okay. And we could talk about it. Just think about it. Okay. So 
while progress is being made in obtaining sustainable funding for these programs, the Northern Board continues to hold this as a priority until long-term program sustainability is achieved. In addition, the board is very interested in participating in the development of the crisis response system. They wrote a position statement, blah, blah, blah. So what are the recommendations? Take our position statement seriously. <laughs> I think, yeah, I think that that would be a good one. Just there's no harm in referring to it twice, right? And then sure. I don't remember all of what's in there. So I don't know if it's, you know, we were writing that with a different goal. So I don't know if it's comprehensive. We might need to still add more recommendations here about funding sources and things like that. But I don't know. I'd have to go back and look at it. Right. Well, one of the thing is, is like develop obtainable funding for most fast CIT, right? I mean, that's part of, okay. Okay, I shouldn't put the Northern Board Advocates. So then I just was trying to soften it. Uh, take into consideration the position. The crisis response. Well, like develop 988 infrastructure in coordination with local partners or something like that. Or local agencies or local, and you can highlight Again, just saying, um, you know, see document or whatever. But it, it, in the event they don't look at the document, right? If they really just kind of just, you know, cut and paste all the recommendations, then it just tees them up that one of the issues on regional crisis response is that we're aware of 988 and hoping to be a part of it. Hey, do you think I should say found here again? <laughs> I think so. This could really drive a lot to the website, huh? If anyone ever read this, I still believe that it's you guys and Joan Hall that reads this. <laughs> um, but, you know, the cool thing about these recommendations is that I, like, I have to present to the Behavioral Health Commission. And so I will be able to say, Here's the priorities. These are the specific recommendations. So I think that this is definitely not lost. Okay. Other recommendations for this? Um, I know previously Mallory was needing like stabilized funding and I see that you have the most and fast in CIT. Is Mallory included in still needing stabilized funding? I think include it. That's a great point. I'd say include it for now. It, it remains to be seen whether SB 156 has solved the problem, but um, it, it, it might, <laughs> but it's not. Um, yeah, still remains to be seen. Cool. And then my other question is the ACT teams, um, would that be something that would be included in here has a diversion from jail and do those have sustainable funding or are they funded to launch them, but we're still working on that? That is a good question. I mean, we've talked about this, right? That like the ACT teams are pretty incredible, um, but that they don't have a sustainable funding source. They're all grant funding. And I think the barrier is that it needs to rise to Medicaid's priority level. So that actually is probably a good role for the board there, if you guys are interested in that.
so what do you think about develop sustainable? It's like actually Medicaid reimbursement rate, right? And reimbursement, but it's not just reimb like Medicaid because wouldn't that be amazing? Like Florida actually just like funds ACT teams. Um, so it would be Medicaid reimbursement and other funding sources to sustain ACT because there's people that aren't residents of Nevada that can't be supported by ACT, right? And then what about first episode psychosis? Everyone's like, not that ugly, baby. But I think that it's important. I mean, what do you guys think? <laughs> it's, it's basically an act team, but for people with psychosis. Sure, I mean, I think include them all. I mean, any program that we have that's working, that's grant funded right now. Should Yay. Go on. Cool. Oh. Okay, so, well, here's the thing, increase access to treatment. Okay, so, right. We'll have to think about that. Okay, because that could go in, in, but that's like sustaining the programs we, we already have. And I would agree that those are for crisis response in some ways. So that's solid, Laura. Okay, any other thoughts on recommendations for this one? I think one more thing you can add is um, what it looks like to help support the CCBHCs to, to do the full range of services that they are, um, like, I don't know if it's mandated to provide or what, but, you know, we know there's some room for different folks to grow in terms of us knowing, hey, if they, they can't maintain a particular line of service, if no one's like sending people to them to do that line of service, right? I, I think we've had a lot of conversations around that um, when it comes to crisis response team or crisis response network. Right, so support certified community behavioral health centers in providing full range of services uh, in coordination with the communities. You know, this is Lana. One of the things that I was going to make a comment on when we were talking about the ACT team, yeah. I find it interesting that ACT is part of the mandated services for my CCBHC, yeah. and yet it is not reimbursable as yeah. um, with an ACT code yeah. um, for billing under Nevada Medicaid. And I right. always found that intriguing. So what we do is we put, you know, the, the type of service. So if it was uh, a group staffing or something along those lines, and then you have to make another notation um, because we're required to have the shadow billings included in our Medicaid billings, um, you have to put two notes in and one of them just has to simply say, this is an ACT client you know right so when they require those services and and i believe in ccbhc's in that one stop shop i think there it has done amazing things for our community and for our organization yeah. um, but if you're required to provide a service and you can't uh reimburse for it then that one stop shop concept out the window you know Lana, that is such an important thing to talk about because I agree, like it would be easier if you guys just had a package rate that you bill for for ACT. Same thing with Carson Tahoe. And, and we really see the difference. So um, the other CCBHCs, it's like they've got like a foot in the water with the ACT program. I'm not talking about yours, Lana, but like around that region. So Carson Tahoe with grant funding, is if they have 50 clients in their ACT teams, but that costs like $600,000, right? Or like four to $600,000 to support that much. And this is just how ACT teams are. Like in Florida, the ACT teams cost like a million bucks each for these teams. 
So they are expensive, but they actually are absolutely reducing the impact on the rest of the system through that, right? They're really intensive. But so then the CCBHCs, each one has like a handful of ACT clients. And that's because they're actually not funded for it. So that's the scary thing that's happening in our region is that we're like, oh yeah, we've got ACT, this is great. But it's all grant funding. And then the CCBHCs are not actually adequately funded to do it. So it's like, that's why this, what Laura brought up is so important. Well, but remember that CCBHCs are reimbursed differently. They're not necessarily reimbursed by the individual service, but by a PPS1 rate, yeah. which is for all services provided during that day. Yeah. But I can't tell the data people at Medicaid that this is an ACT client because it doesn't have a billing code associated with it. Right. So I do get paid. Yeah. Um, and our PPS one rate is recalculated or rebased on a regular basis. Um, so it's not a question of not being reimbursed um, because that one that one day rate would apply, which <laughs> is the T1040 or whatever code. I'm not the billing gal. So um, but it doesn't have a code associated with it. And without that code associated with it, Nevada Medicaid is not going to be able to reimburse anybody under um, a code for, you know, it, it doesn't have to be a CCBHC. It can be anybody who's providing that service and, and starting an act team. Uh, if there's no code to bill by, then um, you've got no Hicks fix codes or anything like that that are going to come into play um, to be able to include that uh, reimbursement model. So I, I just, I think one of the first steps is getting Nevada Medicaid to design or adopt a code for the um, ACT team. Yeah, and they've agreed to, it's just lower on their list. And so I think that's the whole point of these boards, right? Is to be like, hi, we actually want this higher on your list, right? So Nevada Medicaid said they would develop a, a rate for act yeah kind of gone back and forth they were like all for it and then when it got included with the ccbhcs they were like well maybe it'll just go to the ccbhc model but like i said with the ccbhcs the lift is so high carson tahoe is absolutely taking on more of the burden of the act teams so like lana said if you're like trying to get other providers aside from ccbhcs to do act mm -hmm. you need a billing code Lana, just really quick. So from your perspective, is the reimbursement that you get insufficient to stand up ACT teams? Or is it is it okay for the CCBHCs? Because I think we've got kind of like several things, right? Like if one of, if the idea is that the, if we, if Nevada Medicaid says, I'm not going to develop an ACT code for everyone because we're already paying CCBHCs to do that. And part of the way we prop up CCBHCs to do that is to reduce is to not have anyone else kind of getting in that space and that becomes the CCBHC space, that's one thing. But if the reimbursement is not even enough that you're currently getting for CCBHCs to successfully be able to do ACT, then that's like another way of framing it to the state, right? Where we're like, hey, CCBHCs also need this code. All CCBHCs have a unique code to that facility it's not the same rate of reimbursement for every CCBHC. So um, our CCBHC re or PPS1 rate is adequate to cover generally the services that are provided on that one day um, because we do a lot of our ACT team um, you know, in the field, we do them um, you know, in the doctor group meeting. Um, but the, um, you know, clinical staffing, um, but not, e not everybody has a rate that I think would support the intensity of the ACT team. Got it. Um, we just happen to have an amazing rate and have worked very well with um, the state and um, the company that uh, the state contracts with 
to uh, develop the individualized CCBHC PPS1 rates based on our financials from say the previous year. Mm, okay. um, so everybody's different. So I can say that if I do a group staffing with, with uh, just my clinical team, I probably am doing just fine at um, uh, the rate that we have. I do not make enough money for the psych appointments, for medication assisted treatment, and yep. for psych evals. Those I definitely don't make enough money on, but the other ones I do. And in, in some cases, I make enough that it covers some of the deficit that I have from the other services. So, you know, for me, it's a good thing, but I have to say, I can't speak for everybody that's a CCBHC. Yeah. Well, and I think just like realizing that CCBHCs right now in Nevada cannot save the world by themselves, you know, like they are doing amazing work. They're trying to like develop into more, but to just be like, okay, Hey, you got to act right now. The numbers are showing that that is not possible because they are trying to grow into like nine other areas. Mm -hmm. Okay. So are we feeling good on that? I feel like I'm going to lose you guys. And we've got two more priorities to go. <laughs> okay. All right. Increase access to treatment. I think this one could be really exciting. <laughs> so stakeholders in the region identified lack of insurance as a barrier for access to care. Furthermore, there's significant concern about access to care for youth and adults who have insurance, who have insurance. While there is no quantitative data on this, there are many stakeholders report uh, report re, stakeholder reports of struggling to obtain outpatient appointments for youth and adults. They also report not having adequate access to intensive outpatient treatment for youth and inpatient treatment for youth as many adult youths are waiting in hospitals for acute psychiatric treatment. Notable gaps in the region are lack of intensive in-home services and crisis stabilization centers for youth. So I just like kind of winged it and I'm happy to adjust as you guys want. Do we want to follow the theme and put respite care in that last sentence as well? Oh, that's cool. Because you know what? I Yeah, the system of care, they were talking about how important respite care is and that there's like no funding. So So Amy, I just have a quick question. Did Carson Tahoe apply for intensive in-home services for youth? Are you able to say that? Um, no, yeah, I, I would be able to if I do the answer. Um, I would be happy to share. I don't know that, um, is that the intensive outpatient, youth intensive yeah. outpatient? Yes. Well, it's not intensive outpatient, it's the Youth Act. I think that they applied for Youth Act, didn't they? I, I think so, but I don't want to misspeak. Yeah, I know we applied for an intensive outpatient program. Um, yeah, yeah, that sounds right to me. I'm sorry, I, just, I can't say for sure. No, no, and the only point I'm saying on this is that we've talked a lot about intensive in-home services, right? That there's outpatient, outpatient with case management, intensive outpatient, and then there's the ACT level of care. For youth, it's called intensive in-home services, right? Then you have partial hospitalization, well, there's like residential, there's residential managed medication, and then there's non-residential managed medication, right, Lana? I know I just kind of like blew it, but that's the gist, right? Okay, so that intensive in-home services is just like ACT in that there's no billable rate for that in Nevada, right? So they're like, oh yeah, you could have an appointment and then use PSR for it. But in terms of that travel time and all the stuff invested in going and doing outreach in the home, there's not a billable rate for that too. Right. So we that may very shortly be a problem for us if we get that grant funding. Yes. Well, it won't be a, a problem. Sustainability problem. A sustainability yeah. problem. Yes. Right, right, right. Okay. So strategies in exploring access to care for individuals 
uh, issues for individuals who are un underinsured or lack insurance. They identified opportunities to connect under uninsured individuals with care, including the Youth Trauma Recovery Grant and the Region Certified Community Behavioral Health Centers. Uh, the Northern Board is planning to continue to learn more about the topic. It's also interested in exploring other models of care, including peer drop-in centers, living room models, and community support centers. So right now, we have on recommendations, increased publicity of Medicare, Medicaid open enrollment periods or allow enrollment at any time. Do you feel like that's a workforce thing, uh, Dr. Gunnarsson? Oh, wait, no, that's actually access to care. My apologies. Yeah. I'm losing my mind. Okay. Cool. And then increase funding of behavioral health services for indigent person, persons and develop funding for respite care, peer drop-in centers, living room models, and community support centers. Are there additional recommendations that you guys would want to put on here? Anything you want to adjust? Are you happy with these? Hey, can we clarify the increase uh, funding of behavioral health services for indigent persons? Um, are we looking at uh, increasing availability of behavioral health services for indigent persons? And then that, you know, that would make sense that that increase of, they'd have to be funded. Um, but are they not funded now if you have behavioral health services for indigent persons, if they do find them? I mean, I'm curious about that line and what, it re what we're really trying to say. Well, I was just, again, I don't have exact data on this. I've been out of the, the mental health clinics for a while, but it seemed like there was always more people that needed to get into services and they didn't have Medicaid or any insurance that we were actually turning people away at one point in time. Okay, so we need to be, uh, make sure that the uh, services to indigent persons are, um, you know, mm -hmm. nobody has availability. So I think we need availability of, you know, health services for all folks, um, and particular the challenges, you know, identifying the challenges with the indigent persons. Um, it's kind of like, like you know, the emergency room can't turn any way, anyone away for non-ability to pay, right? So right. Kind of indigents were getting, you know, uh, at one point in time at least were not being served because they didn't have any insurance and they didn't want to get on insurance for various reasons or. Right. Um, oh, and, and maybe we just add the line that says increase um, availability of behavioral health services for all individuals, making sure we look at any barriers for unique subgroups of people who need behavioral health, such as indigent population. Um, because I think that's really what we're at, right? Um, do they have a unique barrier? Obviously, no home. I mean, that's part of yeah, No home, difficulty tracking them down for communication. Difficult right. going through the paper. They don't have a cell phone. Yeah. They don't have a cell phone, so they can't follow up. Amazing people who have these cell phones, who have cell phones to make appointments and maybe just identify barriers to some of these subgroups. Yeah, but here's the question I have is so if we're talking to the legislature, the governor, DHHS, are we like because that feels like a strategy that we would do. We would be like, we're gonna identify bad barriers. Um I mean, it's just pretty broad. They're like, yeah. Everyone wants to increase availability for behavioral health. It's about work to mitigate barriers. I mean, you have to identify them to do that. But if if it's like you know what can what can they do? They can identify it and work to work to mitigate barriers. Right? That can be something they work into their strategy. Yeah. And that actually might be something that you know maybe we'll identify that that needs some legislation. I mean, maybe there's something that you know we prohibit somebody from that is indigent from getting mental health because they don't have an address. They don't have all the things that Dr. Gunnarsson mentioned, all this other stuff. And so there are these other barriers. So uh, perhaps we can be involved that way. So if there is something, how do we know if we don't look into it? Um, you know, what, what prevents them from getting my service? Cool. I like it. Okay. Do we have recommendations around how we can address some of the barriers and gaps in for youth services? Yeah. Because that's what we depend on pretty heavily in our needs and gaps, but we don't really have um, something about them in our recommendations. Yeah. So it appears as though, I think most people would agree that we don't have enough youth beds in Northern Nevada right now, inpatient psych beds. 
And Reno Behavioral Health CEO, I understand. I'm just saying this knowing that there is a bias here, but she was, I really respect her, Allison Sednicek. And she said that there is not a high enough reimbursement rate for youth in inpatient psych hospitals. Um, and they increased the rate for adults for inpatient psych a couple of years ago. So I'm just throwing that out there. That was the one thing that's come to mind, but I don't know. I'm totally open. Uh, isn't access to childcare an issue for people getting medical care that have children? So this is, uh, I'm not sure if this is on target for this, but I was thinking, well, what about vouchers for drop-in daycare so people, parents can take their other kids to the doctor? That was a thought that went through my head. Help them with childcare so they can go to appointments. I feel like that would be up in the somewhere else. Uh, well, no, I'm just saying that would be in the access to the basic needs. Where is that? An obstacle. It's an obstacle to attaining services for youth because what do we do with my other kid? Well, I have to take this kid to therapy or something. And if you're talking about family, so that just popped into my head about something that could be helpful. Okay. If you guys want to put it on here. Wait, did I go too far? Okay. If you want to put it on at all, it's just, it's just an idea that popped in my head. Right. Child care is a big issue in the state right now. So what would, what would the, what would it be? Can you say it again? I just can't remember what you said. I'll provide vouchers for, you know, drop in daycare for families so they can take their, you know, so, to, uh, so they can take other children to their appointments, especially that's the idea. I'm not saying it very eloquently, but. Or in order to access treatment? Does it have to be other kids or just family members? Well, I was just thinking of the family that have three or four little, you know, little kids and you don't want to drag the whole family to the psychiatric or, or mental, you know, mental health appointment. So what do you do with those kids when, when you have a particular child that needs more help? Okay. All right. So back to what Laura was saying uh, about youth access treatment to care. Any strategies you guys want to put on here? So if you're hearing that it's a, a reimbursement rate, is that something that we can explore um, whether or not the re reimbursement rate or advocate around the reimbursement rate? So like review adequacy of reimbursement rates or something? I yeah. think there's someone exactly. from Medicaid. Okay. We have people from Medicaid on this call. I don't know if you would be able to say anything about this. They're like, hell no, I'm not going to touch this. <laughs> uh, but yeah, it's like maybe it doesn't need to be increased, but just like, can you check and see if the rates are appropriate? Yes. How about for all youth services or something? I don't know. I mean, what do you, yeah, Ali, you're saying? Yeah, I think if you, I think if you put all youth services, that's that's going to be your best. But I think the other issue is, I know West Hills, when, before they closed, they were having, you know, staffing issues. So that's right. A, but that's what, it, yeah. And that's what Reno Behavioral Health was saying is that, and maybe it's, it is just a temporal issue where like right now nurses are charging a lot. But they were like, we need to pay our enough. We have to have enough money to open up the other wing, right? For males. Yeah. Maybe to ensure adequate or access to care. Yeah, that's good. Okay, cool. Anything else? Or we're moving on to the last one. I'm happy to add something if you guys have thoughts. Okay, cool. Then this is not end all be all, right? Like we can all, we'll check this out on, in March too. Okay, six, develop services to support continuity of care. For years, the Northern, stakeholders in the Northern region have identified issues with continuity of care across the continuum. There are barriers and linkages to care that include lack of formalized referral systems, lack of coordination and communication and limited commu provider commu uh, capacity. 
Uh, again, we are interested in utilizing community health workers to address challenges in continuity of care for individuals with behavioral health issues. The Northern Plan, Northern Board also plans to identify other strategies such as peers to support discharge planning, continuity of care in the region, and look into structural solutions to strengthen warm handoffs. Okay, so the one that Taylor put was support formal agreements between community health workers and various existing programs such as HealthLink, Open Beds, and hospitals. Uh, Laura, is there a place in here for continuity of care with peers or no? They're not, that's the whole point of the role, right? Is that they are linking to care and peers are like more like support, right? Yeah, yeah, the the community health workers would do the linkage, but there is a role in peers for peers doing the peer support, like encouraging them to get to the appointment, encourage them to engage in treatment. So I think that's like the ideal picture is when peers and community health workers are working together um, to support a client. So do you want to put something like that, like identify role of peers in supporting clients? Yeah, yeah, I think that would that would be great. I'm just responding to your earlier concern that we're so focused on community health workers and we're missing peers. Well, and I think this also might be um, because there's peers that are adults who are impacted or who are living with mental health conditions. And then there's also in the youth side, there's family peer support. Okay. And so I think this would be, and part of their job is to helping connect and navigate the systems. So this might be a great place to put them in um, to, to see if we even have adequate within our region. And encouraging. Yeah. Clients to uh Follow individualized self-determined service plan. Yeah, that sounds really good. Or treatment plan, probably. And okay. engage in treatment. Okay, I'll put follow plan and engage in treatment. Okay. What about other people? I think this is one that people are really passionate about. And we could be losing steam and at the next board meeting, we could start from the bottom and work up. But people care about discharge planning. How about like, okay, we have, I understand I'm pushing the state thing right now, but there is a dream of open beds. That could be very real. So what do you think about provide additional funding slash support to fully implement open beds? Do you guys believe in open beds? I'm just throwing it out. When I think about discharge planning, there is a chance to have this behavioral health electronic referral system where we see everything, right? It works in other states. We have that, but Elise, I hope you don't mind me talking about this, but it's like Elise and her one other staff who literally are overseeing like four other programs to try to get everyone to onboard it. And other states actually invest in implementing programs like that. We use open beds for our caring contacts program, our suicide prevention postvention program. And it works really great. The problem that we have is that you know, when we go out to talk to a new agency, they're like, oh, we don't use open beds or, oh yeah, we have it, but we haven't updated. So if it was utilized, like the, the main provider that's utilizing us to send referrals, it works beautifully. Right. So I guess I can say that as somebody who's receiving referrals through open beds. So, I mean, and really like open beds is going into all places, criminal justice system. We could potentially use them for the jail reentry teams. <sighs> you guys just like, give me five more minutes of your time. I just wonder like, if this yeah. open bed is going to require some type of mandate. Some, you know, we, we don't have a choice to get people to sign up. It's been, it's been talked about. I agree. Right. That like, well, you would mandate providers to use it and to update it in certain times. 
So those are two options. Either like provide funding to help expand open beds or mandate use of open beds. And we could put both and put it in yellow and then we could think about it, but okay. Be any incentives for providers to, to uh, adopt this open bed system? Any way to sweeten the pot? I don't know. So I'm gonna put all of those things and then when we have more brain cells, we can come back to it and be like, how do we really want to address it? There's a chat. Marianne, if you're gonna mandate providers to use open beds, are you gonna provide funding or training? That's a good point. Funding, support funding mandate for providers to utilize open beds. I mean, really, we would have an insane amount of rich data on like if people connect to care, uh, when they connect to care, if there's care available, like everything, if people actually use this system. It's really a funny thing in Nevada. Like, we're like, we need discharge planning. We need a database. And then they're like, ta-da, we've spent millions of dollars in open beds. And Nevada's like, we're not interested in that. <laughs> you, as another person said, why don't you put training behind mandate there? Okay. And then, so this is undeveloped, right? But at least we have something that I feel like is more substantial because sometimes I have a hard time with the recommendations where you're like, fix Nevada, you know? And they're like, thanks. Okay, so anything else before we call it quits here or on to the next item? <laughs> I think, Nikki, do you have something? No, okay, all right. So we're calling it good for now, I guess. Well, thank you so much. I hope that you guys read this. Uh, and then I'll, I'll send another, um, draft out and then we'll re-review at the next board and it won't be this painful. Thanks, Jessica. Thank, thank you, you for us. all, thank you for all your hard work, Jess. Absolutely. Thank you. <laughs> Talk soon. Um, so do you want to quickly go to item number six and do that, yes. Jess? Okay, yeah. <laughs> so item number six is for informational purposes only, regional behavioral health coordinator and board member or task force appointee updates on behavioral health concerns, initiatives, and successes in their area of specialty or county or on behalf of the local behavioral health task force. This includes requests and feedback from the task force on policy board progress. Okay, so can I just have five minutes and then we could jump into the other stuff? There's just a couple of things that I think are important for you to see. So the first is, is that we, like this all came from the Northern board. And I know that you guys are like, okay, fine, whatever mental health crisis holds, but your legislation created all of this stuff, right? So we created, and I'll show you the hospital guide for mental health crisis holds through the statewide work group of which Dr. Gunnarsson is an active member. So he is your connection to the statewide mental health crisis hold work group, designated member. Does that make sense? So Dr. Gunnarsson, you can help me with this. Uh, yes. Okay, I got to pull up the right one, sorry. Oh, you know what I realized is I might've sent the wrong one out to the region. So um, I just sent a JPEG of the front page. And so this is even more important that I'm showing you guys this right now. So the parents guide for, I just got to get the right one. JPEG, parents guide. Okay. PDF. Okay. So, it's almost there. This is the parents guide for youth mental health and all the task forces have uh, talked about utilizing this. Uh, let me just scroll it out a little bit. So we split, you know, how we 
the Northern Board's legislation clarified youth mental health crisis holds. So we created a youth a hospital guide for youth mental health crisis holds. We, but the parent and family advocates didn't want them together because they were concerned about scaring parents and having overutilization of mental health crisis holds. So we created this parents guide to youth mental health in Nevada. Um, it talks about that there's increasing rates of youth mental illness in the state. Um, and then we took this U.S. Surgeon General's advisory, which was actually incredible. And the parent and family advocates, we were going to try to like just dial it down. And they were like, no, this is what parents need to see. It's so just, be your screen is blank. Are you intending to show us something? Yes. Thank you so much for helping me there. Was no one else going to tell me that? Okay. So here it is. <laughs> Thank you. Kind of tells about spinach in your teeth. So. <laughs> totally. You're going to listen to me. Okay. So here it is. Parents Guide to Youth Mental Health in Nevada. It talks about how there's a bunch of kids like that are really in trouble right now. And then what parents can do. Encourage your children and youth to build healthy social relationships. Do your best to provide children and youth with supportive, stable, predictable home. Help children and youth. Uh oh, that's twice. Huh? No, it's not. With with other with you and other supportive adults, um, try to minimize negative influences. Look out for warning signs. Ensure children and youth have regular checkups. Minimize children's access. Uh, be attentive. Blah blah blah. Then we have all this Nevada stuff. So like crisis services that they can call. Uh, trained peer support and advocacy services that they can reach out to. Um, and then like 211, which I know no one is like loves, but is here. And then the Nevada Disability Center. So we did statewide stuff, right? And then children's mobile crisis, we're really pushing that. And then we have these awesome frequently asked questions that came from our youth experts in the state. So I'm worried about my youth school performance, withdrawal from friends, activities, sleeping problems, or excessive fears. What should I do? Um, what are common suicide warning signs? Is my youth seeking attention if they're self-harming or cutting? Uh, is it my fault my youth is experiencing mental health issues? What if I'm worried about my youth using medications to treat their mental health symptoms? Will talking about suicide encourage my youth to do a suicide? What are safety concerns? So this, we spent a lot of time on, and they sent it, the Department of Education just sent it out to the schools, um, but we're also going to get this, the system of care, you know, that presented last year, they're going to print out 10,000 copies of this. Thanks, Jennifer. Okay, so that, and then there's also a hospital guide which again, I'll just be very quick on this. It's just, I think this is important. And this is really only supposed to go to hospitals. So, um, you know what I realized is I think that I actually did PDFs on both of those. So I'll have to reply out to everyone and show that. Okay, so also this is important for the board because you guys created this legislation and this is like a follow-up to your um legislation and what's happening so uh we're doing a mental health crisis hold uh an involuntary treatment summit it's nine hours it's free and it's online so there's no barriers to it um and it should be awesome and i was just hoping really quickly i know that you're bored to tears Okay, I sent out the draft agenda. I understand no one wants to spend time giving me feedback on the draft agenda. Can you review it and tell me if you think that it's cool and if you would come as the Northern Board creating this legislation, does that have the education you want or should we put something else on there? Okay, those are my updates. Can we email you feedback, Jessica, because I haven't read it yet? Yes. No, email me feedback. Yes. Or call me, whatever you guys would like. Thanks, Jess. Okay. We'll go to item number seven. It was just for informational purposes only. Update on progress of Northern Regional Behavioral Health Policy Board next steps document and discuss agenda items for future meetings. 
we just have this as a standing agenda item. I think that we rigorously went through our priorities today. <laughs> I agree. <laughs> okay, so we'll go to item number eight, which is public comment. Is there anybody in the public that wishes to make a comment? No, okay, and thank you for everybody for all your feedback and comments too in the chat uh, throughout the meeting. We really appreciate it. So with that being said, we'll move to item number nine and adjourn at 425. Thank you, everybody. Thank, thank you, you, Jess. Thank you. Thank you. Bye. Bye.